Welcome to the SEI Podcast Series, a production of the Carnegie Mellon University Software Engineering Institute. The SEI is a federally funded research and development center sponsored by the U.S. Department of Defense. A transcript of today's podcast is posted on the SEI website at sei.cmu.edu slash podcasts. Welcome to the SEI podcast series. My name is Dustin Updike, and I'm a senior cybersecurity engineer at the CERT division at the SEI. I'm also a graduate student at Carnegie Mellon's Department of Philosophy. The concept of trust is at the forefront of AI system concerns. And in 2021, the National Institute of Standards and Technology, whose research often helps us shape government policy, released an approach on how organizations can identify and manage bias in AI. NIST has stated that alongside research towards building trustworthy systems, understanding user trust in AI will be necessary in order to achieve the benefits and minimize the risks of this new technology. Joining me today to talk about trust in AI systems is Carol Smith, a senior research scientist in human machine interaction at the SEI's AI division. Hi, Carol, welcome. Hi, thank you for having me. Let's start um, by telling our audience about ourselves, what brought uh, each of us to the SEI and what kind of work we do here. Uh, and I'll let you start, Carol. Okay, great. Um, so I joined the SEI about two and a half years ago. I've been previously working in industry for uh, 20 years, uh, working uh, primarily doing human computer interaction work. Uh, I have a master's degree in HCI and uh, have worked across many different industries. And the past um, seven years or so, I've been working in artificial intelligence and more complex uh, systems. And I also teach in the Human Computer Interaction Institute here at Carnegie Mellon. And uh, right now I'm working in the AI division here at the SEI and uh, working on really the connections between humans and machines and figuring out how to help uh, make these systems in ways that humans can trust and are willing to be responsible for them. I also have 20 some years of uh, industry experience before I came here uh, in all sorts of different kinds of programming, uh, systems development, applications, uh, uh, web technologies, that sort of thing. Uh, in consumer and, and B2B type uh, organizations, uh, but also healthcare was my last stint. Um, I've been here about five years, um, jumped into cybersecurity. Uh, we do different types of exercises and training for different DOD units. Um, and I, I love it. It's, it's, it's been really interesting so far. Um, then I then I went to school, decided to go to school here and, you know, have been spending a lot of time on on trust in particular, uh, that's part of my uh, research. And so I, I'm, I'm really excited to talk about, about that uh, with you today. Yeah, same here. So maybe we should start by clarifying what we mean uh, when we use that term trust, uh, particularly in, in terms of artificial intelligence and the autonomy that those systems um, might have. So uh, I think that for our audience, we should probably uh, define the sort of scope for this discussion. Are we talking about how we trust uh, those AI systems or computers in general, um, whether those systems trust one another, um, how we might build such a system, or any or all of the above. Yeah, yeah, and I, I do think it's it's a combination of things. Um, from from my perspective, I certainly am more concerned with uh, making systems that are trustable, trustworthy um, by people. So thinking about what is it that needs to be provided um, as far as evidence for the system. Uh, to be trusted. So what are its capabilities? Uh, what integrity does it have uh, as far as how it was built and um, how it's being maintained at, at a level that's appropriate, of course, for, for the individuals? And then helping them by giving them that information, they can then determine uh, you know, if there is risk and, and how much risk and, and what the situation is. So it's, it's never uh, a situation where we're going to be or should be building systems that are 100% trusted because uh, you know, even with, with other people, there, there's context, there are uh, situations where uh, things are going to change and the system certainly it's going to change, uh, particularly the, the uh, AI systems. And so we need to uh, make sure that they have a corresponding change in that trust and, and uh, literature points to that as, as calibrated trust, the idea of a balance between not over trusting uh, to the point where um, auto automation bias is, is something that uh, people tend to over trust systems 
and not distrusting them or rejecting them, um, but rather calibrating that trust based again on the, on the evidence that they um, have the capabilities that the system has integrity in and is built in such a way that it can be trusted. So you hit on something there that I don't think is often um, distinguished. There's trust and then there's explicit mistrust or distrust of a system. Can you talk a little bit more about that? Yeah, yeah. So we see this particularly in industries where people are concerned about their job security um, or where they uh, feel that the humans are much uh, more uh, talented or, or skilled in a particular area more so than the machine. And in those cases, um, people just have a, a natural distrust of those systems because uh, of their, their you know, concerns about their, their personal livelihood or the work that they're trying to do. Um, and then you'll have uh, distrust because a system does not uh, perform the way people expect it to. Um, so if a system, um, for example, uh, I was talking to someone recently about security systems, and if a security system is overly, um, if, if it's providing too many false reports that, that you know, every single shadow that moves is, is reported, um, people quickly begin to distrust that type of security system. And similarly, um, with a computer, if, if it's constantly giving incorrect information, um, poorly timed information, um, those those types of uh, activities are then um, incorporated into the person's idea of the system and their ability to trust it. And so the trust will, will naturally go down um, based on that kind of reliability and, and uh, effectiveness of the system. In establishing trust, uh, in, in the context of establishing trust with a with a system, maybe it's known, maybe it's new to that person. Um, think about there's been lots of reported examples of bias and mistakes in AI systems, such as uh, I don't know facial recognition, uh, predictive policing, uh, those sorts of systems. And so the the relevant question um, that you get often at the at the sort of holiday. Uh, dinner table is, should we actually even trust these systems? Like, how do we start to engage with a system uh, like the the example of um, predictive policing or or facial recognition? Right. Yeah. And, and my answer would be no in those cases but with, with the current systems, because um, the the data that they've been trained with um, is so uh, unrepresentative of the the larger population and, and that's what's leading to those uh, those problems with the system because of the history um, that, the, that those systems are built on um, so there's a lot of um, bias in historical data there's bias in all data because humans are are, are the ones creating it um, but particularly when you're looking at historical patterns where we know that there has been um, racism or, or some type of um, unfair uh, behavior that has been uh, documented in that data, and then using that to create a new system that you're expecting to be without that bias it is, is um, just not possible. Um, the, the systems can only know what we provide them with, and you can't really take that, um, that kind of um, bias back out of the system, unfortunately. So, um, but on the other hand, there are systems that are very effective. So it really is very dependent on um, the type of system, the, uh, the criticality of that system, and of course, the data that the system is built on. We can't have artificial intelligence without data. And if the data is problematic, particularly for the purpose it's being used for, it is going to create a system that is uh, flawed and, and potentially adds and creates more harm than, uh, than previously there even was in the system. So I think you gave a couple of examples, but are there other roadblocks in either establishing or increasing uh, human trust in AI systems that, um, you know, maybe some of the examples that we gave are, are problematic um, or suspect at the very least? Yeah. Yeah, so, so the, the relationship that people have um, and, and I think you can, you can add to this as well, really, really are um, important in their influence of the system. So if a person is working in the situation where they don't have a feeling of psychological safety, where they don't feel that they are trusted um, or that they don't trust the other individuals um, around them, they're much less likely to have trust of an AI system or, or any other system. So those personal types of factors their previous experiences with similar systems, things that they may not even be aware of can affect their level of trust. 
Um, additionally, as they work with the system, ideally they do attain that calibrated level of trust, but if, if there are negative um, experiences with the system, that trust may go down, or if they're overly positive experiences, um, and, and that's actually can be more dangerous, um, where someone actually becomes much more trusting of the system than is uh, recommended or, or that is reasonable, um, we, can, we can see, unfortunately, accidents occurring because people are less observant of the system um, or less uh, in tune to how the system is working. And, and so the system begins to work in ways that are unanticipated or um, unhelpful. And, and that can be problematic. And all of this points to, of course, the design of the system. If the, if the system is designed with humans um, in mind and, and it's designed in a way that really conveys the right information, allows them to have control over the system, to understand the information at the appropriate time, and that it is um, dynamic in the way that the AI system is, is dynamic and, and really responds to uh, the humans who are using it in good ways or, or helpful ways, um, and then uh, the system also is supporting the work that they're doing, then that, that we get to the point where humans and machines will be able to uh, team. Um, we're, we're still a little bit away from that. The, the current AI systems are very um, narrow in application and, and use, but I'm looking forward to uh, the, the day when we really are able to effectively team with these systems and, and, uh, and have a little bit more autonomy, but still maintain control um, so that we can try them. So one, one complexity that I'm exploring in my graduate work is that humans, we historically have, have thought about how tools best suit a job, right? And computers or machines in general uh, are really no different. And so as a result, I, I come to trust this machine, this computer, because it's really good at this repeated task that I often ask it to do. Um, and so for applications like a calculator, the inputs are always the same. The answers are sort of always the same across space and time. And it would be pretty easy to come and trust that sort of tool. Uh, and then in a transitory way, you see that I get a certain result, you get the same result, right? And and we, 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 we start to build that sort of trust based on the computer being a tool. Um, but with AI, you sort of blurred the lines of what the tool actually can do for me, right? I can ask certain applications, all sorts of questions, and they increasingly answer more and more types of questions, right? And so that, I think, really gets at the, the computer moving from a tool to an actual teammate. And to your point about human-machine teaming, right, that's a sort of different kind of trust than this static tool that does certain things to this teammate that can do many different things. And part of the challenge is figuring out what you know, what that teammate might do and what they do best and how to engage with that tool. So um, do you have any thoughts on that or any experience in that particular area? Yeah, yeah. And it, it's a really, uh, you know, difficult balance. These are really complex uh, questions, particularly when we start thinking about uh, physical systems, but also um, even systems that an analyst might use um, at, at a desk. Um, the way to understand what is appropriate for that um, particular um, situation. So uh, understanding both for new users and users who've been using the system for a long time, um, but also thinking about the, the time cycles um, of the work. So if it's um, very short iterative work or, or very short individual, like discriminant pieces of work, those may be very different interactions than someone who's working on something um, over time, where they're adding information, where the system is providing new information, where new information is integrated, and then a, uh, a narrative or, or, or you know, a, a larger story is being developed um, through those interactions. So, for example, um, uh, healthcare is, is, a, is a good one where you're looking at um, potentially a um, a, a long-term care for a patient and, and how maybe there's a new illness that's added to the complexity of the situation or new patients and interactions that you want to look at um, and, and thinking about how many different individuals may be caring for that patient and how much information needs to be in that system. And then when is the system making recommendations? When is the system pointing to new research? When is the system um, accepting new information? Uh, about that patient and how you uh, manage, uh, you know, uh, protecting their information, protecting uh, other people's information, all of those. So really, with, um, with, as with any system, you do need to think about 
how is this AI, which, which may be a very small piece relatively of the larger system, how are all of these pieces of information being brought together? How are the individuals who are interacting with it going to um, understand what is there and what is available to them and what else may have and also concern taking um, aspects. Um, so if the human is in control, um, primarily, what does that look like versus when the system is in control, P particularly with robotics, um, this can be a really important aspect to consider. So another aspect of this work is thinking of um, how are humans remaining accountable and responsible for the systems. Uh, these systems don't have rights and responsibilities, nor do I think they should. Um, and so really considering how do we make sure that, that there is someone who is uh, in control and um, responsible for the system during those various um, points of interactions. And then doing uh, speculative work to make sure that the system's risks and benefits have been identified and that they are um, really clear to everyone on the team. So that the team really understands not just the complexity of the system, but also the potential harms that can occur so that they're thinking about those as they're developing the system and taking steps to uh, prevent when possible those harms or mitigate them um, as, as appropriate. Um, and then I mentioned um, security with regard to privacy, but also making sure that the system is respectful of, of individuals' information. Um, and even when, um, when people are, are willfully providing information, that we're not collecting more than we need. Um, as with any secure uh, system, there, there's no reason for us to keep additional information about individuals, particularly with an AI system, it becomes more important because the combination of multiple data sets can potentially uh, create new information that, that is a, uh, you know, creates more problems. Um, and finally, um, looking at how to make sure that the system is honest and that people understand that they're working with a computer, that they're working with, with the system and usable. Uh, yeah, really human-centered design, um, understanding the people that are gonna be using the system and making sure that it's created in such a way that they do have that calibrated trust um, because it, they, they understand that it's designed for their use. So, you know, one of the things that um, is interesting is that um, if we were to stand up a system, if we say we were on a team that make, is making decisions based on some amount of data, and we decide to automate that and start to move towards an AI solution, uh, do we have frameworks or tools to help think about how to transition that from an early application that maybe only does certain things, right? And then as we extend, expand its functionality, right, the expectations of the users uh, and the people impacted by that AI system change over time, right? Um, do we, have, as the SDI, have different resources and tools or maybe frameworks for how to think about implementing such a solution and then having people sort of transition with it as it learns to take on new functionality? Yeah, yeah, so we do. We have uh, quite a few tools and we're, we're working on developing more. Um, one of them that I was, I was actually um, mentioning some of the aspects of is the framework for design trustworthy AI um, that we have uh, available on the website. And that lists uh, those areas of accountable to humans, cognizant of speculative risks and benefits, respectful and secure and honest and usable, and, and provides really a checklist, but it's not really a checklist. It, it's meant to prompt uh, conversations and help people start to determine what work they need to do to make the system responsible um, in that way. And then uh, working with the Defense Innovation Unit, um, they have put together uh, the responsible AI guidelines and uh, worksheets. And those, particularly for government agencies, can be very helpful for them to, again, begin those conversations, really understanding what it is that they're um, building, what the uh, ways that they are going to measure the improvements. So looking at the existing systems and processes and uh, using that to then set goals for the new system um, as far as improve um, performance or effectiveness, efficiency, wh whatever it is that they're looking for, really helping them to, to um, set out some goals and, and ways to measure that. Um, and also that has three different um, phases. So the planning phase, the development phase, and then the deployment phase, which uh, really I think gets at what you were talking about, which is this, this constant work that does need to be done to make sure that the system is still performing 
as expected and that is still providing the benefits to uh, the end users or the affected um, communities as expected. Um, and that really entails quite a bit of work, especially when new data is introduced to the system because the system um, may or may not uh, perform in the way that it's expected to. And so doing continuous work as far as evaluating its performance, looking at the data and the results, and, and also, of course, interacting with the end users and making sure that they are still uh, at an appropriately calibrated level of trust be due to the system's performance and that that has not degraded um, it, or you know, been inflated by, uh, by unexpected situations. As an example, in healthcare, if we build a healthcare application, those users might be very different also, right? There might be hospital administrators, there might be doctors and healthcare professionals, there might be patients, right? And they all have different expectations and different pathways to trust as well, correct? Yeah, definitely. Yeah. And, and really thinking about those, those individuals, their needs, different levels of fidelity of information, different types of information they may need access to. Um, all of it may be contained in the same data sets, but, but very different access to that information. And so that should all be considered um, as the system is built so that they do have the right experience. Um, and so that you're not making, uh, you know, things worse with, with the new system, but rather really making the improvements that, that you hope to do. You seem so positive about the future of AI. It's pretty exciting. Um, here, here would be my example. In 1983, War Games comes out, right? Mm -hmm. If you're not familiar with the movie, the, the sort of fundamental question that the movie keeps dangling in front of you is, should the characters in this movie trust what the computer is telling them? Is this World War III or is this a computer simulation? And in some respects, things have not gotten much better. In fact, they've in some respects, gotten much harder to determine uh, whether I should trust a, a, a system that I'm interacting with. And so uh, I, what? because there's a mix of things going on there, there's technology, there's, there's human psychology, uh, there's, there's social issues, it seems like real progress seems sort of uniquely daunting in the AI space for some of these systems. Um, are there some fundamentals or some recent progress that you can point to that make you so optimistic in this space? Yeah, um, so the the more recent discussions about responsible AI and human-centered AI definitely uh, make me very hopeful. Um, but, but to your point, it it's all has to be done with caution. It's uh, the, while I am very hopeful that, that these systems are going to be extremely beneficial in the future, I also uh, feel that, that too little work has been done uh, previously to, to really pay attention to things like trust. And, and, and from a human perspective, um, in the past, uh, there's been a lot of talk about humans just trusting, 100% trust um, of systems. And, and now people are talking about zero trust. And, and neither of those for an end user is is proper or appropriate, um, there has, it has to be calibrated, it has to be made for the individuals that are using the systems. And uh, so there's a huge amount of hype um, about AI, uh, and, and we're certainly not um, meeting those, those expectations, um, and nor will we, I, I don't think, for quite a while. But I am very hopeful because we are starting to accept that these are more difficult problems than people anticipated, that, uh, that making systems that work with humans is a hard problem. Um, the, the AI systems themselves are not easy, but it's even harder to take that AI system and integrate it into an existing social situation or an existing business situation um, because the humans are even more complex. And, uh, and accepting that and embracing that, because that's what makes us awesome, uh, is, is really the, the part that I'm most excited about, is that people are really getting to the maturity in this work to understand that that's the problem to solve, that that's where the real work comes in. Something you said ma that made me think about our phones in general, right? Um, they come with a certain series of applications already installed, and maybe we trust that, right? Maybe those applications are very simple, static, calculator-like applications. But then as we add a new application onto that device, it sort of changes its overall nature, right? The way we interact with it, maybe the questions that we can ask it. And I often get, um, get sort of muddy responses as to what part of the phone 
I trust, right? Yeah. So that's, that's sort of an interesting problem in and of itself. There are lots of different applications running on that uh, on that device, and you may trust them at different levels. But a lot of times, people just see it as this one sort of static object. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and it, it's easy to to think. Well, of course, I trust my computer. Of course, I trust my phone. But but to your point, if you download the wrong you know the wrong app or the wrong uh, information or click the wrong link, all of a sudden your your entire system can be compromised. Um, and and that balance is, is really hard for people to understand. And also, if AI systems are introduced as just computers, that's minimizing the the potential um, harms that that can occur. So so there there is this this we're in this really interesting moment where a lot of different types of technology and different different aspects um, are coming together, and it's really hard for people who are very knowledgeable about this stuff to to differentiate, much less for um, the average person, um, you know, to to really be able to even begin to approach these problems. They don't have time. Um, so it is our responsibility as, as technologists to uh, do a lot of that work for them and to help uh, to protect them by making systems that are, that are responsible, that are trustworthy, uh, that help them do the things they need to do and don't do things without their permission uh, that, you know, that, that aren't a benefit to them. If I can uh, switch gears for a second, I'm just wrapping up uh, a course in uh, normative ethical theory this semester. Mm -hmm. And it's exciting because there's a lot of different uh, engineering students in there. And I think the university has always offered not only specific ethics courses, but uh, ethics for engineers as well. And you, 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 I think what we have seen is a lot more interest in those types of, of courses. And so I have to ask you your experience uh, in teaching at CMU uh, and maybe some of the things that we've talked about today. Yeah, I've seen the same thing. Um, students um, and, and people in the community in general are much more interested in these types of conversations now because we've seen the harms that can occur when um, people really aren't thought about um, when, when systems are rolled out and when those implications aren't considered ahead of time. Uh, and so more and more people are aware of the fact that it is important to think about uh, these types of aspects as you're building the system, not adding it on uh, after the fact, but really from the very beginning, thinking about what the potential uh, implications are, the unintended consequences, the, the harms that can occur, uh, defining those as best you can, and then again, uh, you know, doing that work to prevent it. And even at the you know very smallest levels of code, um, even when you're just bringing in an API, uh, you know that, that is well respected. Being able to uh, be knowledgeable about the known issues with those uh, pieces of, of information, particularly thinking through what, what happens when we bring them together is, is important. And I'm thrilled that, that more people are really thinking that through. We, uh, in one of my classes, um, we have been doing a lot of discussions um, around the, uh, the implementation of these new technologies and having them think about not, not only the the intended use and, and why they're creating it, but also as an exercise, having them do a brief uh, thought um, exercise about what harms could occur because of the system that they've built. Um, when they bring the data and the interactions together, um, you know, and having them think that through creates hopefully uh, a familiarity and a comfort with those kinds of conversations that they'll have in the future when they're on teams making new products. Um... I don't have answers for this, but I'm 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 sort of trying to put together all the questions for how adversaries might specifically target trust. So you you know you can target um, to to steal information from a system, to wreck a system, or something like that. But to actually want to get to a point where the system is is it appears to be operating as normal, users are using it but it's increasingly giving them the wrong information. That might change their behavior in terms of uh, they come to not trust it anymore because what they're seeing in reality just doesn't match what the computer is telling them, or it might actually start to sway their reality in ways that could be uh, harmful, confusing. Uh, and so like, I don't really have specific examples of how you might do that, but you don't have to think too hard about 
you know, some of the things that we've seen in social media uh, dating back to 2016 um, and those sorts of examples as that's that seems to me to be a, a real potential. And if someone would take the time to do that in a way where, uh, you know, the administrators of that system, the users of that system wouldn't notice it, that could be hugely dangerous. Yeah. Yeah. And that's a great point. When you brought up board games, that's what I was thinking, too, because they couldn't tell the difference. They, they couldn't tell what the truth was. And that, and that was, you know, there was a real life scenario um, that, that, that it, I don't know if the movie was based on it or not, but, but where there was an incident um, in real life and the human thankfully did not trust the system um, in that situation. Um, and, th and that is, you know, really important to maintain that, that thoughtfulness, that, that um, mindfulness uh, that humans have of, hmm, you know, my gut's telling me something's not right here. Um, but how do we, get them to do that? How do we help them to, to say, wait a minute, you know, let's pause for a second. Um, is that really accurate? Is that, is that really reflecting your understanding of the situation? Um, and, and figuring out at what moments those are needed, um, are they from an outside, you know, is, is it a manager, is it someone else that, that needs to, you know, intervene once in a while and just make sure that everyone's, um, you know, paying that kind of attention. But yeah, it, it, it's really important that people remain appropriately skeptical, but trusting enough to, to be able to be functional. And, you know, much like our, our, if you drive a vehicle and you, you expect it to turn on every, every day when you go out to it, there needs to be some level of, of base um, expectation, but also, um, you know, the, the engine light, something, some, some kind of indication, but more meaningful than the, the light that everyone ignores. <laughs> I think a good example of that is Stuxnet, and it's not talked about in, in this particular way. But you have uh, the Iranian nuclear program is using uh, older generation centrifuges, right? Because of sanctions, they can't get the latest and greatest. And so they're using these industrial control systems to monitor these cascades over time as sort of a preemptive maintenance partner, right? And so you're the administrator of that network, and every so often a setting comes up that you say, oh, maybe that machine needs maintenance. So, and you know, after Stuxnet is introduced on that network, uh, slowly over time, machines start to fail, but your computer is not giving you that same sort of readout of information. And so at some point, you, you, you're not trusting what it's telling you because it says everything is okay, but this, these machines are failing at a higher rate than we expected. Um, obviously, we don't know all the details of what happened there, but you suspect that they shut everything down in terms of their nuclear program, even even the adjacent nuclear power plants that they're building. And I suspect that's because they really didn't know what was going on initially. Uh, the computer's telling me one thing, but things are failing. And, and that's the sort of example, I think, that, uh, yeah. you know, you can you can take to social media networks, healthcare systems. Uh, it could be a real danger. Yeah. Yeah. And, and particularly if something really is wrong. And they're not aware. It, 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 it's 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 you know the system not being aware, but it's also the, the humans not being aware, and, and and everything in between. Yeah, huge huge challenges, and very specific to the context um, of, of the individuals. A nuclear situation, it, you know, is very different from a um, a robot or you know an autonomous vehicle versus uh, you know, my my financial uh, system or my stock recommender. Um, you know, these, these all have very different um, risk uh, profiles and, and different, you know, effects on, uh, on myself and society and, and, uh, and true, uh, you know, living beings. So it's, it has to be appropriate for, for that particular um, context. It sort of connects back to your comments about different users and different expectations and roles as well. Yeah. Well, Carol, thank you for talking with us today. We'll include links in the transcript to resources that we mentioned uh, throughout this conversation. Finally, a reminder to our audience that our podcasts are available on SoundCloud, Stitcher, Apple Podcasts, and Google Podcasts, as well as the SEI's YouTube channel. If you like what you see and you hear today, give us a thumbs up, please. Thanks again for joining us. Thanks for joining us. This episode is available where you download podcasts, including SoundCloud, Stitcher, TuneIn Radio, Google Podcasts, and Apple Podcasts. It is also available on the SEI website at sei.cmu.edu slash podcasts and the SEI's YouTube channel. 
This copyrighted work is made available through the Software Engineering Institute, a federally funded research and development center sponsored by the U.S. Department of Defense. For more information about the SEI and this work, please visit www.sei.cmu.edu. As always, if you have any questions, please don't hesitate to email us at info at sei.cmu.edu. Thank you.